If you want to understand the inflation in the United States, you must understand the deflation in China. You came here for the truth, so let me unveil that for you. I'm going to explain everything you need to know, which will give you a much better understanding of what's going on in the United States. But we're going to take the view from China. It's going to be an interesting one. Let's begin right here. You're seeing the news. All right, inflation is coming down. Central banks are getting to work and they have increased interest rates to the point in which inflation has been destroyed. We can almost declare victory. At least that's what they say. So let's take a look here. China is the only major economy dealing with deflation. I will say right off the bat, the one thing that I've been thinking of over the last four years now has been that China is doing something very, very different. Okay. And this is an approach that other countries basically could not afford to do. And we'll get into this here and then I'll explain. China has been grappling with negative consumer prices for several months. No other major world economy faces deflation. Their deflation problem comes amid a property market meltdown, extreme bearishness, and weak consumer confidence. You see, they have a major real estate crisis going on. You've got big, big companies like Evergrande and Country Garden that are essentially failing. And with that real estate being the most valuable asset in the world, what was it, $62 trillion worth? Now on the chopping block, well, certainly there's an issue here. So that's deflation. The prices are coming down. But were the prices justified to begin with? And this is what we have to start to understand. Whether it comes in the form of food, energy, houses, stocks, everything eventually comes to a halt and then the investors will decide what the price of that asset is just because your neighbor sold for a million dollars two years ago doesn't mean you can get a million tomorrow it's what somebody is willing to pay for it that day how do we know this if you look at nfts if you look at all these things that are I was seeing articles, I was being told in the comments, I was told off many times by people saying that you want to own digital real estate next to Snoop Dogg because that is something that is so sought after, so fantastic. Oh, but now in the rear view, yeah, yeah, we, no, we don't like those NFT things. So it's funny the way this works, okay? Uh, but there's always another excuse. So we have to understand here what this asset is actually worth. And the market decides that at this given time. They're dealing with deflation. But let me tell you, in terms of consumers, that's not a problem. For the consumer, deflation is fantastic. This is a good thing where the whole world right now is building up and burning from inflation China's dealing with deflation. Yes, it's painful. Deflation is not you know, without pain. But no, if the real estate prices are getting lower, the stock prices have become lower and other prices of stuff becoming lower, that just gives more opportunities after a certain point. It's not a bad thing when you look at it overall. Like you zoom out 10 years, if the whole world is going to start printing money pretty soon and China has done very little of that, who do you think is going to be in this incinerator of flames for inflation you know, aspects when, you, when you're doing this QE and all this you know, garbage that's been going on? Well, what do you think? China is going to be well positioned if they don't start as well. All right. Now, we don't know what's going to happen, but I can tell you up until now, they that purple line there, that is China's assets. So that's the central bank's assets. And yes, Certainly, they've gone up. But just look at it from that peak of the spike in 2015, okay? It's been very minimally, I mean, compared to the other central banks, going going up during that same period. Like, right at that same moment, you look at that dark blue line, that's the ACB. And they went from a rate of, like, of almost $2 trillion, this is uh, in dollars, right, to ten from two to 10, whereas China basically didn't increase. And so that tells you the different stories that are going on right now, where China is saying, we're going to try this, we're going to try a little bit of that, we're not going to go crazy though. 
We're not going to go wild on this, though. They even shut down the whole economy for three years, or two years at least. So just understand what had happened throughout this period. In 2020, the whole world started to print money. They started doing everything they could. The central banks were being so active, all these things, right? In China, they didn't do much. They did a little bit here and there, but to the degree of like Europe and, and the United States and so on, not even close. In fact, Canada, when you look at compared to the GDP, did even more than the United States. So what did China do? Well, they said, our economy, as long as we could still ship stuff out, that was a challenge, as long as we could remain functional, we are going to have so many exports, it's not even funny. And all throughout 2020, the demand was insane. Oh, we need PPE. We need, you know, hand sanitizers and China, 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 make all this stuff. They couldn't get it out fast enough. So they were still moving in that sense. Yep, local economy shut down. There's a problem there. But overall, they could keep things going because they were exporting. So they didn't need to print as much. They didn't need to act in the way that the rest of the world just kind of sitting on its hands like that. They were still producing. Raw materials would be converted into consumer goods. They were shipped out. And that shows us that it's two very different worlds. Now, that deflation, as I've said, could be positive. If the prices are going higher, 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 especially with real estate, it becomes so speculative. And then at some point, a bubble needs to be popped. And when that happens, it's good. Yes, people are hurt in that. That's a fact. But if we can get things back down to reality or at least close to it, then we find people that are willing to, okay, I'm willing to take a risk on this. I'm willing to put some money in and we'll let it go. But, you know, when when the things happen, they're just never going down. You, you run into a very big crisis eventually. And perhaps that's what's happened to China with Evergrande. We were hearing all kinds of schemes and things that were going on. The world is in for another China shock. So in addition to what I'm telling you about 2020, check this out. China is flooding foreign markets with cheap goods again. This time it isn't buying much in return. You see, the consumers in China, by the way, Apple didn't look so healthy because the market for their iPhones in China had decreased significantly. And so that's a big market. And if they're... Chinese, you know, buyers are going to buy Huawei or whatever. Well, then that's not so good for companies like Apple because they lose the potential of, you know, millions and millions of sales. In the late 1990s and early 2000s, the U.S. and the global economy experienced a China shock, a boom in imports of cheap Chinese made goods that helped keep inflation low, but at the cost of local manufacturing jobs. A sequel might be, to, might be in the making as Beijing doubles down on exports to revive the country's growth. Its factories are churning out more cars, machinery, and consumer electronics than its domestic economy can absorb. Of course, right? They go on to the more details. And what I would say about this is that anytime you need some goods, let me tell you, China, China can make it. What they're doing with electric vehicles is funny because other countries are trying to, I don't know, we don't want China's vehicles here. We don't want China's vehicles here because they know they could produce them for cheaper. And, you know, you could say what you want, but uh, they're going to be able to produce it for cheaper and they're going to get it out to the market. And other countries are going to say, well, we got to worry about this and we got to worry about that. And China is just going to produce, produce, produce. They're not so concerned about regulations and all these things. They're just making things happen. So you could say, you know, what you want about that, but know that they are willing to produce goods. They're not going to stop that and know that they want to get their manufacturing continuing and they are now expanding into other markets or growing those. Uh, in particular, what we've seen is Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, which are small in, in the grand scheme of things, but have grown a lot just over the last few years. Um, you could see here China's plan to reshape world trade on its own terms. Um, I found this chart to be interesting. You could see China has free trade agreement with countries and territories accounting for almost 40% of its exports. China exports in 12 months, ending in October 2023. So just look, over the last year, basically, 
Uh, you know, Hong Kong being on top of the list, not surprising, and other countries in Asia. Japan, South Korea, Vietnam, Malaysia, Singapore, and so on. But what's interesting here to, to, to know is that these are also countries that, you know, they're friendly with the United States, right? So it's not as if it's like one side versus the other. Countries love to buy from China. Why? Because are you willing to, and by the way, down here is the UAE and Saudi Arabia, as you can see. Not massive, but, but certainly has grown, okay? So you got to know this. They are willing to produce goods at cheap prices. Are you willing to pay twice the cost for your goods? I manufacture products, okay? And I have looked at all different countries to manufacture products. And if you need something that's plastic injection molded, you look around. Just look around. Look at the different cost. And you will see that there is, you know, varying cost depending on quality and so on. But it's not even a question. And you want certain, uh, I need to produce 500 units. 500 units in the US? 500 units in Canada? Did you mean 500,000 units? No? No, thank you. So just trying to get reasonably smaller amounts. Like we're not talking drop shipping here. We're not talking about one unit at a time being sent overseas. I'm talking about you know, 500, 1,000, 2,000 US and, and Canadian manufacturers, they don't want to do that. They don't even want to do that. So you cannot get something as a small business. You cannot get something manufactured in your own country. I mean, that's the world that we live in now. That has to change. But you can't. I mean, this, these manufacturers got to open up. They got to do smaller runs. They have to be willing to do this or nothing is going to change in this respect. This is talking about the global debt. It's at a record, as you can expect, a ticking time bomb for the world economy. And so what we have here is debt, whether it's in China, whether it's in the United States, that is continuously increasing with interest rates being this high. That is also an additional problem. And how are they going to get out of this mess? How are all these countries going to get out of it? Well, they can't grow. Most of these countries, they, there's no growth there. Look at Europe as an example. There is no growth left. And so they have to print, and so they have to paper over top of it. And that's when you have serious repercussions. It's unfortunate, but this is the direction we are all seeming to be going. This is the interest rate associated with all that. Just think, central bank interest rates, for the most part, they had been heading up. A lot of them have kind of stopped their increases. Maybe they're going to cut, but it's still very high, and that puts a burden on those debt holders, whether it's the na national debt, whether it's corporate debt, whether it's individual, all of these people, look who it is. M the majority of it's the Western world who is in way too much debt. Yes, Evergrande's got some serious problems. Country Garden's got some serious problems. There's no doubt about that. But of course, when you look at it individually, the average person is just saturated in debt. That needs to change or we are not going to have resolution to our issues. So be very careful, be mindful of what's happening here in front of you, and you've got to be able to diversify your holdings. Be mindful of where your cash is and the companies, if you invest in companies, if you're dealing with a business, maybe the business you work for or you own, how much exposure do you have to debt? How much exposure do you have to countries like China or like others that might start to have tariffs on it? This could be another problem. And have you looked at your HS or HTS codes? If you're a business that's bringing things into your country, are they the right codes? A lot of times they're not the right codes and you are spending a lot of extra money. I've got all this type of information in my Finance Friday and the Sunday Business class. Link in the description. This is where everybody comes to get the latest and greatest information. I want to thank you for being here. Hit that thumbs up button and don't forget to come back tomorrow. Take care.